Distinguished speakers, colleagues, good morning. It's my great, great pleasure to welcome you to the 2017 edition of the Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum. Uh, the GGSD Forum, as we like to call it here at the OECD, was established in 2012 to help identify knowledge gaps in critical cross-cutting green growth issues uh, and to provide recommendations to OECD and other organisations for further work in this area. This year, the forum is addressing the critical issue of greening the ocean economy. Over the next day and a half, we will examine the environmental and economic implications of the use of oceans and discuss innovative approaches to making the ocean's economy more sustainable. I need the sea because it teaches me. These first words of a poem by Pablo Neruda, it's a poem simply called The Sea, are a great omen to kick off this form. So much to learn from the ocean. The ocean is our new economic frontier. It is vital for our well-being, for sustainable development, for our planet, period. The ocean holds great resource wealth and holds great potential for boosting economic growth, employment, and innovation. But we need to respect the ocean, to take good care of it, to understand that we cannot afford to waste this precious treasure because without the ocean, there is no life. I recently read in an editorial that I quote, if anything ought to be too big to fail, that is the ocean. It is therefore a great pleasure to open the 2017 edition of the OECD Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum on the theme of greening the ocean economy. The livelihoods of some 57 fishermen and women and fish farmers depend on the oceans. It is estimated that ocean areas within 100 kilometers of the coastlines account for over 60% of the global gross national product. Our report, The Ocean Economy in 2030, I would invite you to take a close look. You will find it interesting, you will find it entertaining, and uh, I think also, hopefully, you'll be very worried after you read it. And again, share that sense of mission that we're talking about here. Moreover, the oceans are indispensable for addressing many of the global challenges facing the planet in the decades to come, from world food security, climate change, to the provision of energy, natural resources, even improved medical care through advanced marine biotechnology. It is therefore as clear as seawater. We need to fiercely protect this vast source of life and progress. Now we have to do a better job at protecting the ocean Marine biodiversity and ecosystems are already under severe stress from overfishing, habitat destruction, pollution, invasive alien species, and climate change. We've also a suite of policy instruments at hand, blue carbon payments for ecosystem services initiatives, reforming environmentally harmful subsidies, taxing marine pollution, and also marine protected areas. This is, by the way, a book on marine protected areas, the economics, the management, and the effective policy mixes. So let's defeat together this ocean policy blindness, again, because it's not a blindness about the consequences, we are already living, suffering, measuring the consequences. Technology is helping, it should help further. 
It is making the ocean's remoteness less intangible, bringing the ocean's perils and potential closer to our minds and our hearts. But this is not enough. We must change our policies and lifestyles, improve our governance, and even more important, implement and strengthen the Paris Agreement, our best hope for protecting the ocean. The key to greening the ocean lies in effective multilateral cooperation. This is the relevance of this forum. This is your relevance. Remember, the ocean is too big to fail. The ocean is in our hands. It's a pleasure to say a few words as you gather to consider some of the most pressing challenges of our time. I really am very sorry that I can't be with you for what I know will be a thought-provoking and inspiring event. In the Commonwealth, we wholeheartedly support the principle that ocean development must be green if it is to be truly and sustainably blue. From the Commonwealth Secretariat, we work alongside our member countries to support them towards achieving this. Blue economy may have become a widely used term, yet sometimes it seems there is too little to guide us on how to progress from business as usual maritime development. The OECD and the Commonwealth can each play an important part by fostering innovation, developing coherent policy, and providing practical guidance. Clear definition will help to accelerate implementation. In doing so, we need to bear in mind that applying tried and tested green strategies suitable on land can present complications at the land-sea interface. Also, that unsustainable practices on land can have a seriously detrimental effect on oceans. This includes poorly disposed and single-use plastic, which so often end up in the sea with harmful consequences. Many Commonwealth countries are small islands, and we have been made only too aware in recent weeks that their coastlines are on the front line of the climate-changed world. That is why, in the Commonwealth, we are now looking beyond damage control. We are examining regenerative uh, approaches that may turn around, rather than simply slow, some effects of climate change. Such an approach is the outworking of our Commonwealth Charter principles of consensus and common action, mutual respect, inclusiveness, transparency, accountability, legitimacy and responsiveness. Furthermore, by looking again at our shared values through a blue lens, we are now working to express them afresh in a Commonwealth Blue Charter for Sustainable Ocean Development. It will need to include shared Commonwealth understanding of green development as a vital component of blue growth. Our Commonwealth OECD partnership will therefore be of immense value in defining such an approach the Ocean Conference was put in place because having created SDG 14, we wanted to see honesty of implementation. And the best way to do that was to get a starting point with, uh, of assessment as to where we were in terms of problems and solutions. And that's what the Ocean Conference was. The outcome was this very strong call for action, which was negotiated by member states over a period of uh, about four months. Uh, please read it. It's a very strong mandate from every member state of the United Nations. It was subsequently adopted by the General Assembly after the conference. It's a very strong mandate, the call to action from the Ocean Conference. Also at the Ocean Conference, there were these seven partnership dialogues with the best of uh, world expertise and, uh, on these seven areas uh, selected uh, were assembled to put together solutions, and so that is also captured from the conference. And uh, thirdly, there are the 1,400 voluntary commitments that were made by organizations and governments and individuals uh, towards ocean action. 
2020 is where I'm trying to get everybody to concentrate on. Three years is about right for us to put into place the commitments that we have made. Uh, three years is necessary, uh, 2020 is necessary because four of the targets of SDG 14 mature in 2020. And so we must, at that point, assess how we've done, uh, where our successes, uh, where our failures are, and what adjustments we need to make to march on to success in, uh, by the year 2030, when SDG 14 matures. So, you know, please, in your discussions over the next two days, think of the interconnectedness of all things. Think of the balance that we have to get between protection and production, because we do have to have that production. Human beings have to eat. Uh, human beings need jobs. Uh, but they have to be, uh, it has to be sustainable. That is the uh, essential watchword. And I leave you with a thought from Mahatma Gandhi that there is enough on this planet for what humanity needs, but there certainly is not enough for human greed. Friends, the pivotal question is, how do we get the sustainable blue economy best? How do we get there fast enough without creating new problems? And within the Swedish maritime strategy, there are four major topics we're working with right now. We are creating a set of indicators to measure our progress toward a sustainable blue economy. Second, we're creating more specific sets of statistics of our maritime activities to better understand their contribution, needs, and impacts. Thirdly, we are proposing the largest environmental budget in our history for 2018 in order to safeguard the marine resources and the prerequisites for the blue economy. And fourthly, we are continuously trying to find ways to incentivize sustainable marriage activities through innovation funds, differentiated fees and support structures like our recent eco-bonus system. We also work with important management tools as maritime spatial planning. And we need to know the goal. We need to know the actors. We need to incentivize actors to move towards sustainability. And we need to protect and restore our base resource the Myron environment. This is an image from something called Global Fishing Watch. And if you haven't seen it, I urge you to take a, take a look at it, look up the website. Uh, this is a big data project initiated by Google and some other partners that tracks about 60,000 fishing boats in real time every second of every day. So these are individual boat tracks from 60,000 different boats. Um, the coverage is excellent on the high seas, and it gets worse as you get closer to land. So it's not 100% it's not coverage as you get really close to land, but we still have s some coverage there. The reason I'm interested in this and the reason I'm bringing it to your attention is that this is one example of new big data that I think could help be an innovation for solutions, a way to innovate on solutions. For example, we're able to track now individual boats and whether they enter marine protected areas or other areas closed to fishing for, that you know, could uh, cause detriment to those areas or to the conservation of those areas. We can use individual behavior to try to back out human trafficking. So we can look at the behavior of a boat that is not trafficking and it, the behavior looks different. Boats actually behave differently, and since we have individual boat tracks, we can learn something about trafficking, drugs, or humans. The story here that I'd like to tell is that this type of bioeconomics, these models, can help forecast the possible consequences of different policy interventions. In this case, we forecast uh, RBFM, rights-based fisheries management, for a number of fisheries around the world using the data set I showed just a few minutes ago. And we compared that RBFM approach to business as usual approaches to fisheries management around the world and to other approaches such as the FMSY or the maximum productivity, we're trying to maximize food from the sea. And what, uh, 
the point is not to say that RBFM is the best. The point here is to say that we now have tools that can be useful for compare, comparing different policy interventions and what their outcomes might be across different kinds of objectives, such as fish catch, which might be most important, for example, in Asia, versus profit, which might be important in countries that favor profit over harvest, and increases in biomass, which is one measure of, of conservation. Uh, more and more collaboration between some of these areas, just to, for instance, mention one, uh, more and more collaboration around uh, uh, sort of uh, players in the area of marine aquaculture and offshore wind energy to try and use the same sort of platforms, try and use the same areas to try and do this in, in, a, in a joined up way. Uh, so more and more collaboration uh, happening there as well. And then finally, I think also around uh, the, the, the sources of, 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 uh, of, of some of these technological progress, where R&D is happening, where re research and development is, is happening. Uh, we're trying to understand this better. We're trying to uh, really understand a little bit how is innovation happening, uh, what are the networks, what is the collaboration which is, which is driving this, to try and also uh, survey this uh, much more, more closely. Uh, because I think one thing we have learned about innovation uh, in the OECD work over the years that you can have a lot of very good technological progress, but if it doesn't diffuse, if it doesn't reach all the partners, if it doesn't reach everybody who needs to use that technology, it's not going to go anywhere. So we need to make sure that it, diffu that it diffuses, that it spreads uh, across the, 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 all, the, all the different countries, and that's where collaboration is, is so important.